and we are live. We have provoked the masses with a provocative statement that work is broken. I have a special guest today who is actually going to make that case, uh, or at least we're going to pick it apart a little bit and see if that is the case. Welcoming book author and outspoken future of work commentator, Melissa Swift. What's going on? Hey, it's great to be here. It's Friday afternoon. Let's go. It is. As folks are tuning in, you remember the rules of this show. Comment frequently and often. Get your points heard here, and we will be addressing your commentary as we go. Uh, Melissa is going to be doing a countdown on why work is broken, some of the top reasons. We're going to bash some HR buzzwords. Then we're going to try to put our heads together, figure out what to do about this problem. And yeah, I think generative AI is going to come up. Sorry, folks, if you're sick of it. But we are going to keep it under a little bit of control. So uh, just, just by way of quick introduction, though, I, I do want to say how this panned out because Melissa is kind of the first person who's ever been on my show who I didn't really know prior associations. What happened was I was on Disrupt TV, and I was I was preparing for my segment with, with uh, hey, Thomas, welcome. I was preparing uh, for my segment with... Uh, with Ray and, and Vala, and I like to disrupt those guys. And so I prepare like pretty intensely, but I'm listening to the interviews going on. And Melissa's talking about some of the stuff we're talking about today. And at one point you said that perf performance management has its roots in slavery. And my ears just went boom. I was like, okay, here's someone who doesn't mince words. This is my kind of person. Like, and I was like, that is a provocative conversation also, and perhaps sheds light into some of the like control, command and control mechanisms behind performance management. So we'll probably get into that a little bit today at some point, but, but so you scored some big points with me there. And then later on Twitter, there was an exchange around customers and how customers don't necessarily always, this, this, this flawed notion that customers are always right. And you, you trotted out this hilarious graphic. I wish I had it handy today about boss baby customers. And I was like, and it turns out this is one of your catchphrases. And I was like, oh my God, boss baby customers. That is hilarious. And like a, a really great reframing of the sort of customer is always right mythology. So anyway, so Melissa, welcome. So happy to have you here. Oh, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited that the boss baby, you know, customer resonated for you. Um, not, not everyone is drawn in by like an eight foot tall baby, you know, brandishing a, a rattle as a oh, weapon. Yeah. So I'm glad you're in that segment of the population who is, who's energized <laughs> by that image. That totally worked for me. I don't know exactly what that says about me, good or bad, but I was, yeah, that was like, yeah, we, I can have a conversation with Melissa. Anyhow, so since then we kind of plotted this show and it's finally happening and we are going to get into why work is broken shortly, but what I want to do first is kind of, that's a pretty intense thesis to have arrived at. So I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of how your views on work have evolved over time, because if we're going to talk about this, we also have to understand like, when did it break and why, right? And so can you take us back, you know, 10, 15 years, however, and, and tell us a little bit about how this evolved for you, your perceptions of the workplace, and you can work in something about your book if you want to also. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's interesting because my book and here, let's show the book work here now. Yeah. Work here now uh, available on Amazon. That's the plug. It, so it, it started off as a really different book, right? In my mind, you know, years and years ago, it was kind of this funny, jokey book about, look, we do all this funny stuff. You know, we sit in open plan offices. Isn't that silly? Right. We do sprints. Why are we sprinting? You know, just kind of like, you know, all this sort of these things that we do that kind of tweak around the edges of work, they're a little bit silly. And then COVID hit. And I had this profound experience. And for anybody who's ever had imposter syndrome, right, this was the ultimate imposter moment where I'm leading a series of global webinars on how to work during COVID, right? I've got my computer on this like rickety, horrible table that's constantly threatening to like crash, right? My daughter's in the background doing virtual kindergarten, which anybody who's ever tried to deal with virtual kindergarten probably has PTSD at me just saying the phrase virtual kindergarten, right? It's a huge mess. I have no idea how to work during COVID. And I'm there like authoritatively instructing people on how to work during COVID. And I just had this kind of big aha moment of you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not just the COVID, right? Maybe there's just something about the, the work 
that is so fundamentally wrong that, you know, you layer on a, a you know, global catastrophe and that shows that it's wrong, but it's not fully the global catastrophe's fault. And I then went into, you know, kind of a, a real deep dive of research about this stuff. And the interesting thing is that it's not like people are like, okay, well, you know, like your question, when did work break? Work breaks periodically. Like it breaks and we fix it and then it breaks again. And the reason why it breaks again is because we change the kind of work we do, right? Like when we originally started doing agrarian work at scale, there were all these issues and we kind of fixed them. Industrial revolution comes. It was a horrible time to be a worker for a while. And then, you know, we kind of fixed it. Like the early part of the 20th century, we really cleaned up what industrial work looked like. And now knowledge work, right? We're sort of at the point with knowledge work that we were with industrial work in like 1895, you know, like the factory is not a safe place to work, right? The, the, the knowledge factory these days is not necessarily a great place to work. So we're here we are trying to fix it again. I find that really interesting. And I'd like to hone in a little more on like that thing around like what, what constitutes broken work. I mean, to me, one of the interesting components is this notion of digital exhaust. And, and I've talked with so many vendors about this and for example, HR vendors, like to what extent is it your responsibility to educate your customers on how to use that type of information to support employee growth versus the opposite, which is a culture of surveillance, right? That people tend to feel like they're being surveilled. And so I think that's an interesting one because I think that really depends on how companies use it. But in general, I worry that things like that do make work feel more broken because it's kind of like turbocharging KPI culture with this always on monitoring crap that reinforces this lowest common denominator notion of what being a productive employee looks like. Uh, Brian says, sorry, I'm late. My RTO is delayed. Return to office due to traffic. No problem. Welcome to the office, Brian. Uh, we're going to get, I want to get into hybrid and flexible work shortly. Uh, Thomas, we'll get to your question in a moment. So, so what do you think about, what do you think about that as far as just the role of, is digital exhaust part of why work is broken now? Oh, it's a, it's a massive issue. And it's, it's so interesting. Like, let's take it to some really simple tools, right? So think about the Outlook calendar, right? A, a tool you probably don't even think about as a tool. So it shows you this whole blank week and you can just fill in, right, with meetings, all of those blank days makes it so easy. It's not even like a little day planner where you have to erase things and write them back in, right? Remember those? Uh, but the fundamental premise of the Outlook calendar is broken, right? You should not be in meetings, you know, nine hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, continuously those five days. But the tool implicitly says you can be. So it's a wonderful example, right? Because it's not a particularly sophisticated piece of technology, but it's given us some really wrong cues. And to your point, the tool itself, it's giving wrong cues, but it's inherently neutral. You know, one organization can use it well to say, look, if X percent of your week is not, you know, just doing heads down work, not in meetings, you're doing it wrong. And another organization can say, well, if you're not busy all the time, you kind of stink at your job. Right. But it, it, it's a great example of, yeah, that, that digital exhaust. And the, the monitoring question is interesting because it gets to one of the key themes of my book, which is a lot of times we toggle off of outcomes at work and onto activity. Um, so, you know, the keystrokes, oh, they weren't doing keystrokes, they weren't working. Well, did you ever like sit back and think for a second, right? Well, some, many of my best thoughts are when I'm not touching my keyboard, but that's not monitored as, as activity. Right. So I want to get further into some of these things, but we'll do it in the context of some of the countdown material you've prepared. prepared. And yes, folks, we are going to ask, can generative AI fix broken work? But I'm going to hold off on that for just a little bit. So you, you AI addicts out there, just hold on for a moment on the AI part of this conversation. So uh, you have some reasons why work is broken for us, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few different pieces, right? And and to your point about the baby at the beginning, right? There's there's some monsters, right? So there's the, the work anxiety monster, which is is visualized as kind of like it's this horrible thing with claws and it's got little teeth. It's it's actually based on a coworker's dog, um, who's not scary, but the dog does look like the monster. Um, 
and then the work anxiety monster is just that voice in your head going, you know, people aren't working fast enough. Uh, you know, they're not working hard enough. And again, like for fans of old fashioned Taylorism, right? You hear some old fashioned Taylorism in, in that, just this belief that you kind of have to just keep, keep driving people. And that really breaks work because it, it breaks down kind of the sanity and the logic of work when you do that. There's not, you cannot infinitely drive people faster and harder. Uh, I think we've, we've learned that the, the hard way. Uh, and there's also, the, you know, this, this boss baby customer that we were talking about at the beginning that, and I trace that one, and this may just be like my particular kind of Gen X thing. I trace that one back to the dot-com era. And we got so excited about kind of like the promise of the internet that we really over-rotated on, on customer delivery. I mean, the, I used to get, I was like in my 20s, I used to get all this free stuff, right? It was great. We loved customers. We went too far. Now we have this boss baby customer who's kind of like in charge of us. They're baby. They can't do anything for themselves. And they're totally in charge of us. And again, that's breaking work because what we think we can give to our customer is far more than our employees can actually give. And so those two kind of monsters I really see as the forces behind um, kind of why work is breaking down. Right. So let's get to the heart of it then. Work is broken. Why? Why would you say work is broken now? If I had to put it in one word, honestly, it would be anxiety. Mm -hmm. That it is just this, this constant worry that we're not going to get to where we need to be. That, you know, this sort of, we, we're not going to grow at the same rate into infinity or at a higher rate. You know, that people aren't doing what they should be doing. You know, that's been such a theme over the last few years. How, how do I make sure they're doing what they should be doing? And then you say, okay, do you know what they should be doing? No. Do you know what, exactly what the outcomes are supposed to be of what they're doing? No, not sure. But it's the, it's the anxiety. It's the spinning anxiety mm -hmm. of, you know, it just, it might not be going right. And, and I believe that that's because knowledge work is so, in some ways, unobservable. That if you think about it, right, factory work you can measure all the, the widgets, um, you know, coming down the assembly line. Uh, agrarian work, right? The harvest happens or it doesn't happen. Knowledge work, you know, do, do, do we really know what productivity looks like for so many of these roles? What output looks like? What outcomes look like? It's gotten fuzzy. And again, when it's fuzzy, you know, the tendency of the human, the human brain is kind of hard on itself. It's anxious. It makes up negative stories. And those negative stories have just totally screwed with work. Mm. Right. Well, I'm curious to see what some of our very uh, astute uh, attendees have to say about whether work is broken or not, though. I'm not sure we have to resolve that in the sense that I think we can all agree there's massive room for improvement. <laughs> Meg Bearer says anxiety expanded by employer surveillance mindset, as you mentioned. Um, Thomas says, might this anxiety come from businesses that regularly treat their employees as resources? Yeah. You think? I, I like that one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the, the, in a world where everything's a resource to be exploited, right? Again, there are no limits for, for human workers. It's like the, you know, the same mm -hmm. as we would drain a reservoir of, of water. We, that's basically what we've done to our humans, especially over the last few years. But I always want to make the point, people think it's just a COVID era phenomenon. It's, it's really not. Um, it's that we were, we started draining people kind of decades ago and it just accelerated recently. We just got more sort of consciousness around it. But trends like like greedy work, right, where you work all the time, that one's been going for decades. It just mm. got a little bit worse. Right. Uh, I told you that we would probably get something on bad bosses. You have a book to show off about this. Yes. Brian says, why is work broken? Bad managers, leaders, executives, they're not creating the work environment that helps people stay years longer than they would otherwise have stayed. And it's, your book you're recommending is not your book. It's not my book. It's Bob Sutton's book, The No Asshole Rule. Okay. And this, this book is absolute genius because it, it, the thesis of the book is that beyond a certain level of, of bad behavior, 
right? That people have just an absolutely toxic effect on the small groups, the large groups, et cetera. It's very much the bad apple theory of you can have one bad apple in a 500 apple barrel, right? And they all rot as a, as a result. And Sutton did some really great work to kind of quantify and measure things like when you have a negative interaction at work, you ruminate on it. It really dominates your thoughts. And that's a concrete drag on both the employee's health and their productivity, both. Like it stinks from both angles. Um, so I, I very much agree that sort of the, the role of the bad boss cannot be underestimated. Sidon Shu welcome says many org strategies are flawed. Meta talks about the year of efficiency. This suggests that they were okay with being inefficient in the past as the dollars were flowing. Right, that would add to the pressurized feeling, right? Melissa, you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Oh, that was cool. weird. Um, yes, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think one of the most interesting things that we've seen in this recent round of kind of expansion in size, especially of tech companies and, and then layoffs, is there's been a lot of dialogue about there wasn't a consciousness of the work that people should be doing. So again, that broken link of here are the outcomes we want, here's the work that gets done to, to get there, right? And here's what we want people to do. Those links were broken. So there was kind of like binge hiring and then and then binge layoffs. It's as if if you didn't know nutritionally what you needed to feed your body and you're just like eating all this stuff and throwing it up, right? That that's a bit of what happened. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to add also that and I I'm going to save generative AI for a little while longer, but I do want to point out that that automation type tools like this I think also contribute to this anxiety culture you're describing because Regardless of exactly how potent these tools end up being, they're supposedly going to be helping people. I also think they contribute to the, that sense that you can be replaced anxiety, which I think ultimately restricts freedom of movement, except for the most talented uh, executives where people feel like I maybe I shouldn't speak out about this or complain about this bad boss or whatever, because everyone is on edge because they're there's this sense that even the stuff that was previously protected from prior waves of automation might not be this time around. And so I better be on my best behavior. I think that's actually very oppressive. And I don't necessarily think that's always the intent behind that technology, but I think that's another ingredient to this anxiety culture that you're describing now. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, I think anytime the power dynamic gets too unbalanced between employer and employee, right, that's when things go really wrong. We're, we're at our best as a society when there's a healthy tension. And, you know, you look at the early part of the 20th century and the rise of labor unions, it's not an accident that a lot of the cleanup of industrial work happened as more workers organized, right? And there were right. just entities that could face off with the companies. You know, we don't we don't need a, a culture of complete worker power or complete company power. We really need that healthy tension and balance. And to your point, if you're insecure about your job because of of kind of, you know, the, the growth of technology, then that power balance goes off. Indeed. Uh Elliot, welcome. He's he wonders if you can restate your perspective on the drivers behind the anxiety. Knowledge work is hard to measure. And he also remembers people having to find cleared outcomes? Are there any other components that jump out at you? Yeah. A I mean, a lot of it is those two things. It's the lack of clarity. It's the brain making up scary stories because it doesn't know the real story. Let's see, could, oh, this is an interesting one. Would expectations be a driver? Could organizations be going too fast? So this is actually, I talk about this in the book. We have an implicit assumption, kind of modern working culture that um, faster is better. And faster is not always better for every initiative, for every task, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's been a lot of great work, you know, think books like Thinking Fast and Slow, right? That it, so we, we have a lot of moments of kind of trying to do slow work fast. And I think that the speed expectation is a really good one to point to. And again, the speed comes from the anxiety. Like, it's not going to get done. Do it quicker. Everybody's moving faster. It's the VUCA. It's crazy. You know, if we could take down some of the myth making and say, actually, you know, you have slow down to speed up moments. Not everything's an emergency, not everything's on fire. And coming back to your point about digital exhaust, a whole bunch of apps giving you a whole bunch of notifications, emails pinging, you know, Slack channels, Teams channels, et cetera. It, it creates in the body a false sense of urgency, right? We're actually mm -hmm. tricking our brains into fight or flight with some of these technological reminders. Brian's comment is going to take up our faces for a moment. 
<laughs> Wall Street and executive teams love to see people hit short-term targets, couldn't care less about the knock-on effects, some managerial decisions, canceling people's vacations. Has on long-term earnings. It's kicking the can down the road problems. Uh, so Melissa sees a long-term issue. Executives are too short-term focused. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a great one. And I think where the rubber will hit the road is um, actually that we're not going to have access to as many humans as we have historically for a whole bunch of reasons. The workforce is um, actually shrinking, right? That birth rates are lower. Um, you know, there's been economic research that young men are coming out of the labor force um, to play video games, right? There's a whole bunch of factors just like hitting the workforce. And even things like, you know, if you look at the background of generative AI, right, it requires all these human beings in the background, like training on data sets, you know, doing yep. doing all these things, right? So we still need a lot of people. We're going to have fewer people. My hope is that we end up having to treat people a little bit better because we don't have access to them as kind of a mass commodity in future generations of work. But that's my Pollyanna hope. Okay, we're just about to generative AI, but I want to hit this first. Thomas says, I might not have heard it, but how is broken work exposed apart from people being anxious? Interesting question. Yeah. So I think it, the interesting thing is I think broken work hits the actual business bottom line a lot more than than people think. So we've really become attuned to the well-being angle. But I, I think it, it it actually, there's a productivity angle too that and it's funny, I'm, I'm like a reformed productivity geek. I actually, in my days at Deloitte, I taught a class on productivity and like the Pomodoro method and like just getting all the things done. And I, I, I've reformed off of that stuff, the like the productivity crack, because actually, you know, this mindset of just accomplishing more and more tasks, it, it, again, that's, that's, that's broken work, right? It's intensified work. It's having to do too many things per, per unit of time. Uh, so one of the interesting things is that we have all this technological progress and actual productivity kind of tick, tick, ticks up very slowly. Mm. Uh, so a lot of times the productivity that organizations are searching for actually comes from kind of fixing, fixing the work of just pulling activities out, having work better understood, better connected to outcomes. That's the place that I think broken work is stealthily showing up, but we just haven't um, diagnosed it that way yet. Right. So now we have arrived to the question you posted on LinkedIn a while ago and tagged me on, and I actually vented on this topic. It was can a good vent. Can generative AI fix broken work? Oh, shit. oh, sorry that my bullshit thing went off right then. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> what What did you learn from uh, from from this post and and in the thinking so far on can generative AI fix broken work? Yeah, you know, anytime something comes along to do kind of relatively uncomplicated work, right? We get really excited about it, you know? I mean, think of the invention of gears or the wheel or, you know, any of these things, the cotton gin, right? That we, get, we get excited about these, these technologies that take kind of a, this underlayer of work off. Uh, but what we don't realize is it's, it's like, um, I don't know if the analogy is Jenga or Tetris or something like that, but you pull that bottom layer of work off and everything just shifts, right? It's like when you delete it, I guess it's like when you delete a row in Excel and they're like, just shift rows up. That's, that's actually what happens. So my conclusion was ultimately, you know, generative AI could fix broken work or it could make it so much worse that, you know, let's say, you know, blinkered bosses, um, it decide that that Gen AI is good for more than a first draft on certain things, as a for instance, right? So you get overloaded with work again, and meanwhile, Gen AI, you know, it generates an interesting working first draft that you still have to edit three times. I mean, I know you in in your writing, you don't use it, right? Nope. Yeah, I don't either. I just i i like I like to put the words together myself, uh, but something like that, where the wrong assumptions are made about how the technology interacts with the human work, it could just make things worse again. There's no, there's no technology that humans can't misuse. Yeah, for sure. And um, I, I know I mentioned this on a couple other shows, but just want to say it. Diginomica is one of two publications along with the Financial Times that says we will not use generative AI in the authoring of our content. We were the first. I'm not saying they followed us because we did it, but um, 
but but anyhow, I, I I do think it's kind of interesting because I think in a way the the question is a great question, but it, the framing is awkward in terms of can generative AI fix broken work? And the reason it's awkward is because it all depends on the employer and how the employer's culture works, right? Because I I know some employers are going to use this as a headcount reduction exercise. Now I think in many cases it's going to backfire because. The reality is, if you study large language model technology, it's just not accurate enough, and that's that can't get fixed any time in the in the near future. By that, I mean years, um, at least two, maybe longer. So the point is, it's not going to get fixed anytime soon. So the point is, like some company going to try it though. They are, and they're going to suffer the consequences for doing so. But the other interesting thing that I think about is for some people, I could see how it can help. And like you could see how it's it would be almost like having like a personal assistant at, at, at its best. It would be like a personal assistant where you could say, hey, I need to post a job description for this position that just came up. Can you send me the information on this so I can quickly post it? I could see that being really helpful. Or, or hey, can you check and see, like you think about travel crap, right? And how tedious that is. Like, can you check and see which dates in the next year would be available for me and whether coworker to go to some show or something? Like I can imagine at its best, it, it could be a bit of a sort of HR assistant to a worker. But again, I think so much of that depends on Brian's thing around bad bosses, bad management. Is it, what is your culture like? Because if you plug these types of potent tools in a, in a bad cultures, I think it's going to be friggin' miserable, but in good cultures, I think it could be interesting at times. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. At the, in the same way that, you know, if you were again, come back to our industrial worker in like 1890, right. If you were in a, poorly run factory, people were getting arms and legs lopped off all the time. If you were in a well-run factory, it was great. This machinery was enabling you to do so much, you know, same, same thing. Yeah. Unintended consequences. Right. So in just a minute, I want to get into some um, HR buzzwords that drive you crazy. But before we do that, I want to ask you about this performance, man performance management and slavery thing. Because I think I think it's a really interesting understanding of like sometimes work is is at least partially broken because of legacy concepts that have overstayed their welcome. That seems like a, a good candidate for that. So tell, tell us more about that one. Yeah. And it's funny. That's a big red thread of my book is there's like there's a sort of a hangover from, um, you know, old working practices that are just really terrible that, that hang out for a long time. Performance management's a great example that we didn't really get interested in managing individual performance until we thought we owned people, right? Like literally own them, which is so, before that it was like, okay, the harvest got done or the harvest didn't get done, right? That's on all of us, you know, that's a, it's a collective issue. And then, but we got very interested in this issue of um, individuals because we, we thought we owned them. It was like, you know, how much milk did this goat give? It, it is literally the most inhuman way of thinking about people. And it is still reflected in our performance management um, processes today. And it's, it's very interesting because a lot of organizations, coming back to your point about how data on employees gets used, a lot of performance management um, measures can tell a different story depending on how you, you look at them. So you look at things like you know, utilization or hours worked, you know, a lot of organizations will say, okay, linearly, right, you work more hours, your utilization is, is better, uh, you know, great, right, you're, you're a top performer. But what that may actually indicate is that you are doing things that are not good for productivity. I mean, there's data that shows that we're not super productive after about 55 hours a week, which is not that many. Um, so you may be, you know, actually unproductive for a big chunk of that. And B, there's tons of research from, you know, the World Health Organization and folks like that, that working those excess hours me meaningfully degrades your physical health. But by our performance management measure, right, which is just linear, right, it's not efficient frontier, it's just straight out this way. Um, you know, so we're, we're effectively rewarding the wrong things. But it comes from that, that history of it, it being a way for absentee slaveholders to, to measure their slaves, which once you see it that way, you kind of can't unsee it. Well said. So I want to continue deconstructing the state of modern work. We are in the problem statement portion of our broadcast. 
And then we are going to shift gears into what the hell are we going to do about this and what are the smart companies doing. But in the meantime, I do want to get into your most hated HR buzzwords, and I do invite the audience to participate in this also. I think you might have a surprise or two for this audience. So give us give us the one that's top of mind right now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think in, I don't know, the last 24 hours, it, it, several candidates have, um, have emerged. Um, I think actually two that are really, and they're related, two that are really bothering me right now are reskilling and upskilling. Uh, because again, it's it's kind of in that weird performance management um, way of thinking of kind of like, you know, Melissa is a cow that gives this much milk, right? It, the, you know, they there's something about how we're thinking about people and skills that's that's gotten a little bit dehumanized. And it doesn't, again, part of what bothers me, I think, is it doesn't reflect the actual reality of work where we are kind of constantly learning and shedding skills and it's very, very fluid. And the idea of kind of like these people need to be upskilled, you know, that, that it, it, there might be something fundamentally wrong with the construct. It, it might be that simply we need to construct conditions under which these people can access their natural agility, that it's not just about stacking skills you know, like food on a cafeteria tray. And so those, those have started, I've been thinking about those, those words a lot and kind of, you know, again, are we, if we were going to think about people really humanistically, you know, would we think about them as kind of bags of skills? I don't know. Yeah. So you have another one too, that I think is on your mind, which is this notion of, you don't like the quiet phrases. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us why not. Like quiet quitting and stuff. You're not a fan of those. Why? No, no. Because I think part of what may have gone wrong in terms of this, this sort of broken work is also the expectation that people should go above and beyond, right? We want discretionary energy. We want everybody to like go above and beyond and just do more than the job requires. Well, why? Why do we want this? Why not just design the job properly? the first time, right? Like what, why do we want extra from people? You know, and then we're like, I don't understand why the workforce is so burned out, you know, by a number of research measures, right? People are the most burned out ever. It's like, well, yeah, you, you know, you ask them to give 120% for the last, you know, how many decades? Well, yeah, they're out of, they're out of stuff. They're out of gas. Um, so I, I, I don't like the quiet quitting test because why should it be wrong to just do your actual job. That's, that's a, it's a weird point of view. It's a super weird point of view. Again, when you take it back to this kind of humanistic thing. Yeah. I've got a couple of related things that really bother me. One of them is the, this notion that people, I get all these PR pitches around like uh, 70% of workers are, are strongly considering quitting and moving on to new job this year. And I'm just like, but there's never a survey that says how many actually did. And, and I think unfortunately a lot of people have strong talk, but ultimately they're, they're afraid or they're more immobile for the various reasons I've described before. I have no objection with the idea that the top 10 or 20% of talent call their shots in this job economy, but I deeply question whether everyone else does. And, and these surveys don't help like, yeah, so-and-so intends to quit this year. It's like, we all intend to do stuff. If you ask me if I intend to like make more money this year, Oh yeah, I intend to make 25%, whatever. Like that's useless. That's friggin' useless data. So that's one thing. Yeah. My it's other, a, it, oh, yeah no, I'll, I'll hold the other. You respond to that. Let's hear what you say. No, what? I was just going to say that it's actually something we've done research on for, for years and for decades, we've been at about the 30% mark, right. In our research, which you know, in terms of intent, I believe that. But it's like, yeah, one third of your workers are kind of ticked off all the time. That I can believe, right? Because the, the data hasn't varied that much over incredibly right. long periods. And if of you time. want to talk about what the what the productivity cost is of having people that are that are ticked off and disengaged and kind of keeping one eye open, that's to me, that's a whole different conversation. That's a different conversation. It but, doesn't mean right. they actually intend to leave. It's just it's a marker right. of worker happiness. My other big problem, and I think we can get some of this in the solutions section as well, is this whole notion around like 
talent shortages and talent gaps because while I'm willing to concede there are some certain talent gaps in certain areas, for example, if you're uh, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, you're probably going to not be able to hire like the 10 best data scientists in the U.S. like to move to Sheboygan. I get that. But in general, I don't think we have a talent problem. I think we have an inclusion, flexibility, training, and overall like work culture problem that we can't reach into marginalized communities and diverse populations and get people who are unbelievably talented and, and get them engaged. Now, employers hate that because they want everyone to hit the ground running and stuff, but stop it with the talent shortage talk. Like it really makes me crazy. It's been going on forever and it, it just BS. And, and if anything was demonstrated on the pandemic, it's that we now have enough remote collaboration tools to do that. So the idea that you can't is just crap. And, you know, for me, like, I, I remember when I ran a local recruiting firm here, we it was pretty sophisticated, like, recruiting tech sales stuff. I would recruit people from restaurants all the time, you know, people who were just on their game, on the ball, and they were eager for something better, different, whatever. There's all kinds of people like that out there, people working from home because they have to look out for an aging relative, all that shit. All these people are being excluded, so don't talk to me about talent shortages. That's my other uh -huh. Issue. You're playing my song. I would like all of that knitted on like a tea towel, right? It's um, it, it, I, I think it's it's a meaningfully underestimated factor that there's, you know, yes, there's a shortage of, you know, apologies, like the same, you know, middle aged white men you've always hired, right? Right. They're in your local geography, to your point, right? Yeah. Fine. yeah. There's a shortage of that. There's no shortage of the actual thing you need. And that's actually, I got to say, like, you know, like bringing some, some sort of positivity to our, our ranting. One of, the, one of the most encouraging trends that I've seen is that I, cause I talk a lot when I give talks and stuff about, you know, untapped talent populations in the book, I talk about formerly incarcerated people who are one of the most egregious examples, right. Of an untapped talent population with like 27% right. unemployment in that population, huge chunk of the U S workforce. Cause we love to incarcerate people. And then we don't, we exclude them from the workforce. It's like a hot mess. As I've been, you know, so the book came out in like January. So I've been giving talks the whole year. And I ask routinely, okay, how many of, you know, of the companies in this room, how many are looking at some of these kind of untapped populations? Like, you know, everybody from, you know, like moms coming back into the workforce, formerly incarcerated people, uh, non-English speaking, um, foreign born workers, et cetera, et cetera. And the proportion of hands that go up has steadily risen even throughout like 2023. I mean, I was I had a room full of government contractors at one point. And I said, how many of you guys are looking at hiring formerly incarcerated workers? Every hand goes up, right? So that's kind of an awesome trend of exactly the problem you're talking about, about just sort of like not looking at most of the actual available um, right. workforce, right? That, uh, you know, th that seems to be happening better. Brian says, talent shortage. Employers with no training program and career development infrastructure have no right to carp about a talent shortage. Why do they think other firms must incur the cost to train their future job force? Ooh, we have a bell there for that. Yeah. Well done, Brian and yeah. Greed. Yep. No, no I love Train that. available talent. Sorry, Melissa, go ahead. We lost your audio for a sec. Melissa seems to have a little bit of a connect issue temporarily. Yeah, Are you I'm back. back. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, so respond to that last one of Brian's. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that one. I love that one. And it's, it's part of why I think I get annoyed with the kind of the whole skilling conversation. We lost Melissa for a sec there. Sorry, folks. Hopefully we'll get her back soon. Uh, by the way, while we wait for her, because uh, I do want to get into the solutions part of this discussion, I promise before we close, we'll have some ideas on what to do about all this. Uh, if you have your most hated HR buzzwords, please post them. I did some searches earlier. I found one, um, pick your brain, which isn't really an HR buzzword, but that one I always hate to get that in my inbox because it's like, it seems so painful to get your brain picked. Uh, LinkedIn user, sorry, I can't see you here, um, your name, but train available talent. Inclusion is a big thing. I agree. I applaud your efforts to recruit 
from where nobody is willing to go. I think Melissa is back. I'm back. Yes. Melissa, so, hi. Sorry about that. So as, as I was, sorry, I'm at the highest level of escalation with my cable company and incidents like this are, are why. No um, worries. So yeah, the, the, uh, I think the, the point about relying on others to get your workers that, you know, the, the skills they need, some of that actually comes from, and this is why I get annoyed with the whole kind of skilling conversation, a blinkered view of what's required to do any given job. So an interesting example um, comes from, if you're familiar with Greystone Bakery, they make the mix-ins for Ben and Jerry's. They have what's called open hiring. They will hire, if you can prove you're legal to work in the United States and you have two forms of ID, they'll hire you because they believe for a lot of those bakery roles, all the whole job is learned on the job. And there's something fascinating about that model. Could we all go to that model for every job? No. But if we shifted our beliefs about how much of the job is learned on the job and what you really need to hire for right out of the gate, I mean, you've probably seen all the, the jokes, you know, on various social media about, you know, I need eight years of experience in this programming language and it's only existed for five years, right? We have very weird ideas about what you need to do certain jobs. If we could dial that back a bit, that also, I think, helps with that dynamic. Some interesting comments. I don't want to get too heavy into uh, like a diversity race conversation. Tom is talking to middle-aged white man. It's a quest for inclusion, sometimes becoming a self-serving thing. Inclusion, more important than capabilities. I certainly don't see it that way. Uh, Brian says, while you're debating the skill shortage, let's dive into why firms won't hire older, very experienced people as they just want cheap and experienced for it folks ageism is far from dead look i don't have i don't want to get into all of that in this broadcast because that those these are really nuanced topics that require like very careful discussion but the one thing i do want to say is that my whole thing around not taking advantage of flexible work collaboration tools by definition limits your ability to tap into talent that is both diverse and qualified because to brian's point around aging population it's another example of a population along with people that perhaps have neurodivergent issues or or disability issues many of these people are much more comfortable either working from home or having much more flexible work environments like that hardcore nine to five commute life that, that so many employers are desperate to return to including zoom of all things which is a whole nother thing like that type of work culture is by definition i think not going to be able to tap into the the most capable talent and and my view is if you tap into that talent, you are going to have a more diverse talent pool to Thomas's point by definition. It's not about saying, oh, I want to be more diverse. It's about I want to be more talented and use every tool at my disposal. At least that's that's how I see it. But I don't want to have a huge conversation about that today. But Melissa, if you want to have a comment on that. That's no, I, I completely agree. And it's interesting as I was doing some of the research for the book on, on greedy work, right, that um, – uh, it, that model of a certain kind of in-office culture, certain kind of working hours, right? To your point, it it really limits you to kind of a, a chunk of folks who, you know, either, you know, like don't have kids, have a non-working spouse, right? Like it really pulls down if anybody with any kind of caregiving, you know, you can't really be a caregiver for an elderly person. You can't really, you know, live somewhere far out of a metropolitan area. Like it just, that model inherently lops off a lot of people. And then we pay the people who fit that very narrow demographic model a premium, right? So we create an ever more imbalanced world as long as we stick to kind of that that narrow model, which it, it sounds neutral, but to your point, it's not neutral, right? It is explicitly excluding just like whole swaths of talented people. Indeed. And and that's we could have a full hour on this particular discussion. Several and there's hours. some really interesting there's interesting programs out there. I just talked to someone last week during my vacation who is looking at some local programs at, around the University of Michigan that help um, minority students who have technical talent acquire some of the sort of overall professional skills aspects that they're not used to in those environments and, you know, that are kind of court, more corporate environments. Like there's all kinds of things you can do to bridge that gap. And, you know, but that's not really, you know, the conversation today. But my, my only point is that I just don't want to hear employers talk about talent shortages at all. That's just, uh, unless you're trying to hire like a very specific kind of data scientist or something, just shut up with the talent shortage stuff. Um, anyway, um, but I, I want to skip ahead a little bit. No one else volunteered uh, 
any of their hated HR buzzwords, this is your last opportunity for that. There's one more I want to hit on briefly before we get into solutions, which is, Melissa, can you briefly give us your take on employee experience? Like the term, useful term, crappy term, what is your take on that? So it's it's interesting because it's like, it's I, I would say it's about 10 feet away from useful. That um, it, it's sort of too big picture. And a lot of times it gets very focused on kind of milestone events. And, and those milestone events are important. Like, don't let me say, I'm not here saying, you know, onboarding isn't important. Like that would be a crazy statement to make. But what we don't focus on and what I am sort of literally becoming obsessed with is the everyday experience of work. And that's what employee experience is like, you know, is the cafeteria nice? You know, it can get into these very performative things. And actually think about like probably the world's most boring engagement survey question, which is like, I have the tools I need to do my job. Everybody measures that question and nobody really looks at it. But that, I'm sorry, that one question that's your everyday experience of work question. And that's really important. Whether people ex- like literally are enabled to do the work they're trying to do, right? That's what you should be looking at, not as the cafeteria nice, right? So that's where employee experience needs to kind of telescope in and be about that thing, right? Can I do my job or not? Is it hard or easy to do my job? Period. Indeed. Okay, let's rifle through a few quick comments here. Brian says, uh, so isn't Melissa's key point that in work, nostalgia is not a strategy? Return to office is an example of living in the past thinking? Yeah, I mean, any any strategy that kind of presupposes that there was this, this utopian state of work. I mean, it's funny. I was having a conversation with somebody about, you know, oh, wouldn't it have been cute to live in the 1950s? And then we're like, no, it would have stunk, right? Everybody was like sexist and racist and this thing and that thing, right? It wouldn't have been cute and fun at all. Um, we need to think a little bit more rigorously that way, that that this kind of idea that there was, you know, there was a, a work utopia. And if we could just go back there, any measure that drives toward that, I think is is, is fundamentally, you know, wrongheaded. Alan hates the term enabled. Thomas hates the term resource understood. Uh, Alan loves your phrase 10 feet away from useful, by the way. He says he's going to steal it from you. So be aware of any copyright issues there, both of y'all. Uh, Sudanshu says utilizing collaboration tools for remote or hybrid work requires managers and leaders who can set the appropriate tone. Many so-called leaders who moved up due to tech skills as individual contribs fail in creating an optimal work environment as they don't know how to lead. So then we talk a lot about things like skills, progressions, and things like that. And uh, Sudanshu, by the way, great to see you in the chat. You've been great today. Come back for more in the future. Uh, So, okay, folks, let's shift gears a little bit now because uh, we can't fix work. We can't fix work today. I realize that. We only have 15 minutes. Can't fix it. Uh, And we can't even necessarily decide, completely agree that it's broken. I think we could have a debate about that. But we know that it leaves a lot to be desired. We know that. So let's let's put our heads together a little bit on, I, I doubt there's really very few companies of any size that are getting this right across the board, but we could still hone in on some of the tips, tactics, and inspirational interactions that we've had on this topic. So I'd like to ask the audience members to also help us with this and help guide us towards some of the things we can do to reframe this conversation towards how can create better experiences and improvements. What do you think? Yeah, so I'll say, you know, one of the things, to your point, nobody's doing this brilliantly today at scale. But one of the things that I see organizations doing that really, you know, kind of gives me heart and hope is changing some of their thinking around metrics. So, you know, what is it, you know, can't measure, can't manage. what are the, the metrics of success and trying to toggle off of activity metrics and things like, you know, hours worked or, or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, really looking at impact metrics, like what are the actual results of, you know, this human's work. And, and to some of the conversation in the chat about um, managers, I think another encouraging trend is marrying up sort of manager level data with the data about the teams around them. So you can look at very simple things like, does somebody's team have a high rate of attrition? That's not always something that we look at. We're like, oh yeah, the team has a lot of turnover. Well, maybe that team is led by a complete jerk who doesn't know how to manage. And just again, sort of, you know, 
taking two seconds and saying, are there little pockets of the organization where toxicity might be really creeping in? I think that's also a, a very helpful trend. It sounds so micro, but where does work get done? Like work gets done at team level. So if you can identify where there are unhealthy teams in your organization, which 99% of the time traces back to an unhealthy leader, right? That's another strategy that we're seeing organizations try to employ a, a bit better. I want to get to that in, in the context of AI in just a minute. But before we do that, uh, I think this notion of KPI culture is interesting because KPI culture is here to stay, right? In, in the in the vast majority of organizations of any size and scope. People are going to, their performance is going to get measured. But w- to me, what it comes down to is, are you measuring the right things? And yeah. and and do you buy into your own metrics? And do the met- are the metrics humane? And do they make sense? So for example, like, like the way Amazon delivery drivers function in the gig economy, those metrics are insane. Like they're inherently dehumanizing because they're, they're all volume based metrics. That's all it is. Right. So, um, but that doesn't mean that every form of measurement or KPI has to be, I don't believe the KPIs are by definition inhumane. Do you, I mean, it comes down to how, how they're created and how they're addressed. Yeah. And, and just being sensible about things like, like volume, right. There's a ton of examples, you know, be, be it, delivering packages, packing things in in warehouses, doctors seeing patients, anything, again, where you pretend it's not an efficient frontier, you pretend you can linearly just keep going out forever, right? That's that's where those metrics kind of go off a cliff. The AI part really interests me because I've talked with a lot of vendors about in the HR space about their generative AI plans and their AI plans. I've written about this on Diginomica, by the way, in terms of the implications of putting a user prompt in front of an HR UI, which I think is potentially very dangerous in terms of the discriminatory implications. For example, if I ask, like, show me the best salesperson in San Diego or whatever, and I'm trusting the AI system to show me just the top three or whatever, that to me is very, very concerning. But on the other hand, there's some very interesting stuff with AI too, because in theory, you can use AI properly to help compensate for your human weaknesses, right? So, so for example, your thing around sort of identifying these areas of poor performance, well, AI is great at pattern recognition. Surely AI can recognize poor performance patterns. I've been disappointed with HR vendors in general that they haven't been talking about how to use AI in this regard, because to me, that's very interesting, right? Because patterns of discrimination, patterns of poor uh, uh, skills development and advancement, all of these patterns exist within organizations and some of them fly under the radar. Now, granted, even if you identify a pattern, then you have to have the corporate courage and conviction to act on it. But in my view, the technology could be an enabler for a better workplace in that case. Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's a wonderful um, use case. And it reminds me of there was a great study of doctors came up with criteria for diagnosing uh, various kinds of tumors. And then the AI was better at applying their own criteria than the doctors were at applying it. Right. So it used the sort of best of human thinking. Right. Which the the doctors were better at coming up with the criteria for a tumor, but the AI was better at applying it. Right. So to your point, humans are probably better at coming up with, okay, here are the probably some of them. We can probably get some of them and then AI can derive some of them. But here are the characteristics of a team where something toxic is going on. Right. But then Mm -hmm. AI, to your point, is going to be amazing at applying that criteria, because what happens when humans go to apply it is, oh, but that's Bob's team. Bob, Bob's great, right? The, the bias stuff creeps back in. So it's kind of like if we can at least build some hypotheses, right? Then the AI can be amazing at just taking that clear eyed view. Okay, if I apply your hypothesis, right? This is where things are really going wrong. Yeah, and, and Brian, on your bad bosses sort of uh, stump speech, I honestly believe that these tools could be used to weed some of that out, but it would require both... Uh, technology and corporate fortitude, but I don't think the technology to do that is necessarily that far off at this point, but the corporate fortitude is is a whole different matter entirely. Um, I'd love to hear more from the chat on, by the way, Thomas, your manager versus leader thing, I will get back to that. Uh, so thanks for that. I haven't forgotten that one. And thanks to those of you who are commenting on that. Uh, the, the thing I wanted to say, like from the chat, please let us know if you are seeing some things that help 
create better workplaces. Certainly empathy is undeniable there. Um, I think the other interesting thing from an HR tools perspective is that some of the technology is getting better and more interesting. So for example, um, employee listening like ha- and things like that are moving more to what I would call continuous frameworks where you're getting feedback much more and giving feedback much more regularly, right? Yeah. So I've talked with a couple of vendors around this where I've asked them like, can this employee provide feedback on a bad work experience, a bad manager, a bad project? And some of them have figured out ways that employees can do that potentially without getting exposed by that feedback. But the but the general concept is that moving towards more continuous cycles, so you're not waiting a whole year to talk about what is your work experience like, what is your performance like, but you have a more, obviously you don't want to do that every day. It would feel like surveillance, but that notion of being able to make course corrections, I think, is one of the opportunities we have in front of us. Now, granted, that cuts both ways, right? Because if you're getting better feedback from employees and you're not acting it, acting on that feedback, then actually I think the technology is going to make the problem worse because then people are just like, what the hell? Fuck it. Like I gave this feedback and you didn't act. Right. Right. So, you didn't but, with it. but my point is that the technology is less and less of a barrier for that in large organizations, if that makes sense. So Anyway, that's what I think. I don't know what you think, but. No, absolutely. And I think that's going to be, it's interesting because this discussion of what does it mean to be a data-driven leader has kind of been going on for a few years now. And I think it's one of the most interesting sort of discussions in the leadership field about what is, what are actually the psychological characteristics required to see data like that and be able to move to action, right? Like you have to basically, you have to quiet your own biases right? You have to be humble enough to, to take the feedback, you know, either about yourself, about somebody else, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you have to quiet a lot of internal noise to just listen to that data. And then you have to have a lot of courage to actually make change based on the data. So a lot of times we think, well, leaders don't, you know, like know how to read a chart and tableau, right? That's not the problem with data-driven leadership. It's all of, to your point, that sort of like the emotions and the actions that then cascade off of because what the reality is we're in an increasingly transparent data-driven world like we're going to get more and more and more good interesting hr data but then we really need to retrain leaders as to what to do about it especially in a not so distant future where more of that data is visible to employees you know i think that's the that's the other wrinkle of okay now we have this great dashboard and i can see that my division is more ticked off than every other division so I'm mad at my specific leader, right? Because I could see that. I see the data. That's the world we're driving toward. And that requires a whole other set of leadership behaviors than the ones that we've historically rewarded. There's also an interesting example via a case study I did on Accenture. And I'm mentioning Accenture because over the years, I've probably said one nice thing about Accenture for every 20 things I've said that make fun of Accenture, including its ridiculous metaverse web me hype from a year ago that they walked back already. But um, so anyway, that's my shot at Accenture. But now that I've taken my shot, uh, the the case study uh, was fascinating because it had to do with their skills ontology and how by creating a skills ontology that was uh, updatable and, and consumable by AI, et cetera, all the different things they're able to do with that and one fascinating example was to move away from degree requirements, essentially rules-based requirements, and focus more on skills. And so I got an email from a PR person around like, well, AI shouldn't be like, we have to stop AI from over-screening applicants. And I said, well, isn't the whole point of AI to move past rules-based screening because you don't need to limit the data sets as much because AI can handle big data sets. So let's get rid of the screening technology and allow me to search broader inclusive applicant pools based on skills tagging instead and and get rid of some of those ridiculous screening like, oh, screen for MBAs or screen for this or screen for whatever other ridiculous thing. So in my mind, that's that's a, oh my God, this is awesome. This is one of the best things I've ever seen in a chat. Um, I got I to gotta stop for a sec. Um, John Reed, you placed me at an interview with Accenture in the mid 2000s. Oh my God! Woo! You you freaking win the chat, man! That oh, you just absolutely killed it. That is just absolutely friggin' fantastic. Oh my God! Oh my God. That is just. So but anyway, so so my point being, like, I think that's really interesting, and I, and again, 
you still have to act properly on it. And I'm not saying that Accenture is always doing that. And of course, Accenture has far more resources to invest in their their human IP than a lot of organizations do. But I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a, I'm a big crusader for things like getting rid of degree requirements, all of the kind of like you must be this tall to ride stuff in, uh, in job requirements is it's just to your point, it's unhelpful because it doesn't really connect with the person's ability to do the job. And my belief is we will actually move past that skills ontologies today are in relatively rudimentary form, right? I mean, if you've ever seen, like, I remember seeing an example of skills for a pilot and it was things like air traffic control and leadership, right? Like these things are not, it was like, the, these things are not quite equivalent, but we're getting there, right? We're getting to a rough description in skills of what it means to be a pilot. As those get better and better, and more and more sophisticated and better account for things like sort of interpersonal agility or mental agility, right? The, I don't have the skill, but I can get there quickly piece. Then we really get to a future where to your point, we just, we don't need all these stupid like social badges that often have to do with kind of privilege and not much else. Yeah. The only thing about Sudan Chu, only thing about your comment is I'm not sure about the time frame because I wasn't recruiting in that I stopped recruiting in the year 2000 pretty much, but anyhow, but you still, you still got me good. And uh, thanks. That, that was worth the whole show. Um, but, um, but yeah. And, 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 you know, on, to be honest, if someone told me today they were interviewing with, with Accenture, I would say go for it. I mean, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, having said that, like what other final things, Melissa and the chat, please participate uh, in this. Try not to get too distracted by the humor. What, what are the final pieces the chat is seeing as far as opportunities for fixing broken work? And Melissa, is there anything that we missed that you think is kind of a good opportunity for individuals yeah. and companies right now? I think just kind of thinking about the, in, in the digital information age or whatever, sort of what are the limits of human beings? You know, we used to have natural limits, right? It's like, I can only, um, you know, harvest vegetables for so many hours before I like fall over, right? And we just, we don't have a great sense of those in terms of knowledge work, in terms of technology driven work. If you can you sort of establish those and just know when your workers should kind of like tap out and they're actually not productive and they're not healthy. Um, you know, it's like it, it, a client of mine used a sports analogy. He's like, I can have the best team in the world in terms of skills, but if they're not healthy and they're not on the field and they're not playing, we don't win. Right. So a little bit of that mentality of just better understanding kind of the limits of humans in today's way of working. Um, I, I think injecting a bit of that, you'd be shocked at the productivity bump that then comes from that, to be honest. Yeah. And I would also add that there's so many interesting things around enabling more flexible and inclusive workforces that haven't been tried. And like, so for example, I, I see the opportunity instead of like more rigid return to office mandates, experimenting with a mix of remote work and more localized co-working centers that are much closer to home. Uh, Zoho has done some very interesting things around what they call transnational, transnational localism, which is using remote work technology to allow people to essentially work in more rural areas and re-inject uh, those economies and, and, and perhaps even have some organic farms while you're at it, not too shabby. Um, so, so to me, there's some really interesting visions for the future of work that are possible right now. And I only get a little bit irritated because I feel like we're walking that back so much, you know. And I think it, to me, I was just so disappointed in Zoom for I instituting their three days. It wasn't a full office mandate, but it just kind of felt like of all the companies that should be real advocates for the ability to build that culture, shouldn't it be them? Um, you know, and, and look, I'm not saying that, that some FaceTime isn't important, but I just thought that was a real missed opportunity. But I, I do think there's other companies that are acting on those things. And I think the future work is so interesting from that perspective, models that we just haven't even explored yet. So that's my feel good uh, sort of statement about things. Yeah, there's some nice, uh, nice innovation in that space, um, particularly in actually in life sciences, where they tend to be a bit progressive in trying some of these different models. Some of those companies are doing things like, OK, you can work remotely, you know, three weeks out of the month. And then one week, we're all going to come together for these like very specific activities and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, again, that might be the right model for your company, the wrong model, you know, whatever. But I love to see the innovation. I love to see the like, it doesn't have to be programmatic. We can play with different ways. We can include different groups, you know. It, and it's, it's funny that the same company, when I was talking to them, they were saying that one of the best things to come out of the pandemic was that 
whole categories of, you know, kind of work in the sort of central part of the, like not, you know, making the biotech, you know, drugs or whatever, but um, that they realized that there was this great untapped remote work population to do some of their administrative work and that they were just, they treasured those folks and, you know, weren't going to slough them off now that, you know, we can work more in person. So they were, you know, just trying to like, like, again, like testing and learning and making the balance work. And I'm very energized by examples like that. Yeah, Alan brings up union, unions are the equivalent power over concentrated with boardrooms and shareholders. And, and Alan, I would tend to agree also that this is one area where I don't have as much research done, but but that notion as as big tech companies become globalized, it becomes harder and harder for local workers to respond to that. And in the that balance that Melissa was describing earlier has gotten more and more out of whack, right? Um, so there's not, I don't think there's a lot of easy fixes there, but there's clearly a need for more of a balance there. Yeah, and I would add that I think there's a piece about scale and complexity too, that you can have very, very good intentions as a company, but simply be at a scale and a complexity where things just do not operate well then at back at, at team level. So I'm also energized by some of the experiments about, you know, should the, I forget what the numbers are. I've heard everything from five to 150, but people work better in X smaller unit and let's make sure we're broken down into those units. That's that's mm. kind of some cool innovation too. Yeah, and Tracy says flexible work for the locals, short commute, do part of your job after you pick up kids from school, then come to the office in the mornings, do your relationship building parts, interviews. Love that. Yeah. And 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 then I think I think it's interesting to think about like how you put together policies that incorporate that flexibility, but but also limit that thing around did you get my email Friday night at eleven PM or whatever? Like you know what I mean? So like, like finding a way to balance that out where you have the flexibility, but you still feel like you, at some points you can legitimately unplug. And so I think that's really interesting to figure out like how, how do you do that? And, and, and I think, again, I think technology can help structure that because you can have these times blocked off where people can easily see like so-and-so is not around right now. Like, and, and eventually you should have email delivery systems that don't even send the email when that block exists right? i was and, gonna say just unplug the server right I mean, yeah. just you can do brute force things with email that are really helpful right so anyway i think those are really interesting and i think there's i think some companies have opportunities and i'm not saying that every company is going to going to do that but but i think what's exciting to me about the future of work is that some companies are and of course i'll be rooting like hell for them to succeed right and and prove that those more flexible approaches to talent truly work because if i'm right that you can incorporate more talent by using these things then there's got to be some bottom line proof of that at some point um so everyone deserves boundaries personal time off collaborate back and forth now we have the culture we want indeed Alan says job sharing Sharing. creates resilience and balance. Yeah. There's all this fluidity too, right? Between temp work gig perm and Brian, who's in the chat has done a really good job in past articles on Diginomica about kind of helping to see what some of the limitations are in classic HR systems for helping people with things like that. Like, like people coming back, alumni coming back to an employer, for example, like the more flexible our systems get, I don't think our systems are there yet. But certainly you hear HR vendors talking about this much more now, like like how to have systems where there's much more fluidity that matches the fluidity of the workforce. I think that's another positive trend. Yeah, so absolutely. how's that for positivity, huh? Yeah. No, these are all good things. Yeah. When we collaborate. Yeah. Combine work with an offsite Sudan, fun event. Sudan, she oh, says, being in New York City where we collaborate in person, it's more effective to combine work with an offsite fun event. Spend half day a meeting, second half as a fun outing. And oh, that's that's one final point that I love too, which is don't we now have the opportunity to really think about what is the real magic when we're in the same room, right? So what are the key things that happen there that we can't do like on a on a call like this, right? And and I think Sudanchu's really got a really astute point there that spontaneous fun and kind of just hanging out is clearly one of the big things that is like an in-person winner. So the more we kind of figure that out, the more we can, we can plan an, an office footprint around that. Right. Unfortunately, right now we have a lot of companies who are desperately trying to rationalize their existing brick and mortar office footprints. And that's a big, 
big yeah, reason. You, oh, Alan's I, saying that I Alan's saying that you're making me less cynical. Uh well it's magic. Look at that. Yeah, it is. Well, and Alan, you know, conversations like this make me less cynical too, right? I mean, it's this is why we do these, is because we, you know, we have to maintain our intellectual curiosity about about what's possible. So anyway, we're we're heading towards the end. So folks, get your final comments or questions in. This audience members, you were terrific as usual. Uh, whoops, got the wrong one there. Uh, setup was a little more complex. Thinking that through and build it before they get here. Yeah. So yeah, there are some complexities, right? So that's true. Um, it's not as simple as everyone show up at the water cooler, talk about their no, weekends, but There's, there's but. a few things you can do. Like if you can reduce the number of meetings in the workday, I think that that's like a, just again, a brute force thing that helps a ton. So then you have more time for, to your point, like the fun hanging out, the spontaneous conversation, right? Just that's, that's people's biggest gripe about being back in the office is I'm sitting there in, in meetings the whole time and I'm not like actually inter really interacting with people. So that's one good brute force measure, I think, that helps a lot of the things that people are talking about. Sudan, she was correcting the Accenture dates. Yeah, exactly. That was in the 90s, but it doesn't take away from the potency of your point, which, and, and look, it's, 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 it's actually one of my talking points in, in our world, which is that we're all, we're all implicated in the industry. None of, none of us are above the problems that we criticize. And so that's part of my whole vision behind this show and how I approach things is we're all part of the problem and we're all part of the solution. So, you know, even though I might criticize Accenture, I might also criticize my own approaches to things. Yeah. Um, no. All these models are brilliant and will go a long way towards reducing mental health issues. Indeed. I, I certainly feel that way. Yeah. Uh, yep. And great, great show. Yep. And excellent comments. Everyone's happy. So Melissa, thank you for your debut. Any final thought? Did we cover it all? I think, no, I think we got it. We, we fixed it. We're good. We fixed Let's, work. Yeah, we're good. We're okay, good. No, well, I would, yeah. I would just say lots of great thoughts and like people keep testing and learning, right? This is an evolving area. So to your point, like we're all part of the problem. We're all part of the solution. Just keep trying stuff and like, tell us about it. Right. That's, that's what we got to do. Yeah. And we keep trying to document these stories on our site. And yeah. I think everyone else should do the same because we really like ultimately, like when you yeah. think about these things, what you really want, like is you can learn from smaller companies, but I think we all owe it to ourselves in this world to think about how these things can scale in bigger organizations, because that's where it gets tougher. And, and what, what I, what I'm looking for in general is the combination of an inspirational vision and then a maturity model that we can all understand so we can understand the steps. And so, Melissa, I think you went a long way today towards helping us to understand what some of the steps and issues are that we need to confront along the way. So hopefully everyone's got some great takeaways. Had a blast hanging out with y'all. And, oh, and by the way, next Friday, Brian and I are going to debut what we hope to be about a monthly show, which was originally inspired by, by Brian's sort of month in review column he was doing for us. So, we're going to try to create kind of a enterprise month in review vibe thing. So, uh, so yeah. And Tracy says, we're going to prove the model. Yeah. I love that kind of talk. Keep us posted on that. So I'll see you next Friday with Brian for the debut of month in review. Thanks again, Melissa. That was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much fun. Later all.